What makes a deck casual? How could we tell when a deck has crossed the line from casual onto something more like tuned or even optimized or high power or CEDH? Where does the line get drawn? What can we see in a deck list that could tell us more about whether a deck really is casual? What does casual even mean in the modern Commander metagame? Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today we're going to talk about deck alignments again. You may recall we talked about deck alignments a few weeks ago with Sage of Fables when they introduced their deck building rubric and we discussed it in depth. We're going to go further in depth today talking about another one of our alignments. But before we do that, let's quickly review. The deck building alignment or the deck building rubric that Sage of Fables presented has two axes, just like a D&D alignment chart, which took into account a deck's texture like Battlecruiser or Synergistic or Combocentric. And today, we're going to be looking at that other axis, a deck's optimization. And we're going to start with the slowest style of deck in this category, casual decks. First and foremost, I've got to get this out of the way. Calling a deck casual is definitely a loaded term in the current format discourse. Sage themselves was pretty open to trying to find alternative phrases that we as a community could use. But for now, casual is what we have, so I'm going to roll with that. If you have some better suggestions, please let us know in the comments. Sage defines optimization in the rubric as the process in which we manipulate a deck in order to generate card velocity, mana efficiency, and consistency in creating a certain game state. The more optimized a deck, the more likely you will be able to consistently recreate a particular desired game state. They go on to explain, the optimization axis describes how consistently and how quickly your deck is looking to create its winning board state. Which to me sounds similar to our concept of the critical turn, which we've discussed before. This is the turn on which, without interaction from your opponents, a deck can have opponents on a meaningful clock ticking down towards the end of the game. Casual decks are the ones that are likely to have a very late critical turn, 7, 8, or 9, or more. Casual decks tend to have a very late critical turn for a number of different reasons. First, casual decks tend not to be running optimized mana bases. Lands are far more likely to be entering the battlefield tap, which means that they are typically delaying their development by a turn or so regularly throughout the game. Lands are also unlikely to be providing perfect fixing meaning that assembling the colors of or types of mana which they need in order to assemble their game plan is a lot more difficult. The givens of a fully optimized mana base and the perfect CDH meta with perfect fetches plus duels plus shocks with unrestricted five-colored lands entering the battlefield untapped is not something to expect in casual decks. Take a look at the color-fixing lands, which have seen print in recent standard legal sets. At the common on common level, we've seen the gain lands, non-typed, non-basic lands which enter the battlefield tapped, tap for up to two colors of mana, and then spot you a single point of life on enter the battlefield. We've also seen the snow duels from Kaldheim, typed, non-basic snow lands which enter the battlefield tapped, and enter the battlefield tapped, non-typed campus duels from Strixhaven, which allowed you to tap for two different colors of mana, or tap and pay four mana to scry one. Basically, these lands would give you some small upside, such as being typed, or allowing you to scry, or spotting you a point of life, in exchange for the downside of coming into play tapped. The exception I'll point out here is Command Tower. I do think that Command Tower is a likely given across all 2-color, 3-color, 4, and 5-color decks in Commander. The problem of having lands enter the battlefield is actually fairly minimal when there is not going to be a lot of pressure in early turns to get all set up, and players can take advantage of the getting ready stage of the game at a slower pace. The problem is also much less significant when you already have multiple lands in play, and top decking an ETB tapped land isn't very detrimental, particularly when it represents only a small and incremental increase in your total mana for the turn. But taken together over the course of multiple turns, these ETB tapped lands mean that players are going to be spending multiple turns each game quote-unquote behind their normal land drops. The next consideration for us to make is that mana ramp tends to be much more expensive. Three and even four mana value ramp tends to be the rule, not the exception here. I remember when I was really getting into the format, one of the pieces of conventional wisdom was you run Kadama's Reach and you run Cultivate. 
And then there were lively discussions as to whether we shouldn't be just going straight for cards like Ranger's Path and Explosive Vegetation and Sky Shroud Claim, because these got you multiple cards directly into play, paying four mana to jump ahead two mana up to the six mana mark, a much more explosive play overall. So in casual decks, why would you one for one yourself to get a forest into play with nature's lore, when for one mana more, you can get a forest into your hand and a mountain into play, tapped with Cultivate? Why risk the damage off of a talisman for colored mana, when you can have all of your colors off of a Cultivator's Caravan for one mana more and no risk to your life total? To be clear, more expensive ramp is also usually more impactful. Wizards has even made it a point recently to try to print more three mana value ramp with interesting upsides or build arounds, particularly when taken at rare, to make this form of ramp more appealing. Trading one card for two cards with a cultivate is, in fact, a form of card advantage, and it's an advantage on game actions, but it is also more time spent in the getting ready stage of the game, before you are able to consistently multi spell where you can develop your game plan and interact with your opponent's game plan at the same time. A good way to guesstimate if your deck is casual or tuned is to look at your ramp. If you are leaning more onto the 2 mana value side of ramp, you are likely tuned, while 3 and 4 mana value ramp is going to be more common in casual games. Also, you kind of want to ignore Soul Ring when you're looking at these numbers. It's Commander, and Soul Ring is just basically the mascot of the format. I would not count that in most of your calculations. As a result of these slower and less consistent mana bases, these casual decks are also slower and less consistent overall in assembling their game plan. In their rubric, Sage estimates that most casual decks will have an average mana value comfortably above 3 in most cases, where tuned decks will usually be below 3, and high power decks will be closer to or lower than 2 on their mana value. But, the slower games also lend themselves to more explosive plays late game, as players can usually afford to wait and play the less efficient version of spells, which also give them more value. Five mana board wipes with upside, like Fumigate, are a great way to turn a board full of creatures into a big cushion for your life total. And if your metagame is slow enough, a degree of pain can turn eight mana into a board wipe and a big new grip of cards in your hand. Mana isn't the only consideration, though. Casual decks are also going to be lower on consistency of acting on their game plans because of a lack of card velocity. Casual decks will not be able to depend on having sources of reliable card advantage, and most will not be able to reliably access key pieces of their deck strategy with tutors. That is not to say that casual decks don't have a game plan. While it is true that casual decks are the most likely in the optimization category to lack a definitive game plan, plenty of casual decks do have a clear game plan. That game plan just comes online less consistently and much later than tuned or high power decks will. The question you may be asking is why? Why would someone want to play a deck that might not even be able to do its thing? And it's a question of mindset. Sage reminds us in their article that this optimization level is the one where players could be running theme decks or have placed self imposed restrictions on their building. Maybe your dungeon deck has opted to play more expensive versions of common effects to make sure that you have lots of ways to venture into the dungeon. Or maybe you've imposed a restriction that your Sphinx tribal deck will only run Sphinx creatures, meaning that you won't be able to take advantage of other power house cards like Archmage Emeritus, which could otherwise accelerate your card velocity with all of your instants and sorceries. Oftentimes, when a player consciously chooses to build at the casual level of optimization, the goal is less to achieve the going for it stage of the game and more to enjoy the individual cards that get played during the getting ready and all set up stages of the game. Another common question is, how can this deck be casual? It's running a mana crypt. Intent plays a large part in this, as I alluded to above. A player who happened to open a mana crypt in a mystery booster pack would probably be excited to include it in their deck and a single zero-drop artifact, even one as powerful as Mana Crypt, does not consistently change the trajectory of their games. Similarly, one of the regulars in my casual playgroup happened to open a Mystical Archive Demonic Tutor, which she immediately put into her Dina Soul Steeper deck. A single, powerful, unconditional tutor is still limited by the fact that most of the rest of the deck is built around draft uncommons from Stixhaven, 
which led to life gain triggers for Dina. Individual cards do not make a deck casual, nor do they disqualify a deck from being casual. It takes intent and multiple cards to move the needle in this way. The last question I want to touch on is actually a common one I hear from CDH players, or players who are used to playing at more high-power games. How do I actually build a casual deck? I feel like I can't do it anymore. I actually think that the recent rounds of pre-cons from Wizards of the Coast, particularly the ones from when they started releasing one or two pre-cons with each standard legal set, are generally good places to look at when you're trying to remember what casual really looks like. And before we go further, I do think that casual has changed over the past few years, or what casual may mean. If you look back at older pre-cons, particularly from 2011, you'll see that the format was in a very different place. Zedru the Great Hearted had a total of six ramp spells in it, with an average mana value of three right on the nose. And if we don't count Soul Ring, as I suggested earlier, it's actually 3.4, with two different six mana ramp spells, including one that is a very inconsistent creature that only ramps you when it connects with combat damage. That deck also had every non-basic in it, entering the battlefield tapped, and the average mana value of the deck was 3.17. Meanwhile, the Prosper Precon released last summer is running 11 ramp spells, not counting the Commander and Grim Hireling, both of which can make treasures, with an average mana value of these ramp pieces being 2.27, going up to 2.4 if we skip Soul Ring in our calculation. We still see 6 enter the battlefield tapped lands in the deck, but two of those are conditional and could enter the battlefield untapped with luck. So maybe even Wizards of the Coast has left the heyday of quote-unquote casual commander by our metrics behind. That's a whole different can of worms, though, and outside of the scope of this particular episode. If you want to build a deck that you intend to play in a more casual playgroup, I first suggest skip the tutors in favor of some more interchangeable payoff cards. Look for some of those cards that were always so cool but never quite made the cut in your other decks, and put those in where you would have run a tutor instead, where maybe you'll finally get a chance to see if you can make Priest of Forgotten Gods win a game for you. Another thing to look at is trading in a few of your 2-mana value ramp spells for 3-mana value ones. Or, if you're going to lean on cheap ramp spells like mana dorks, maybe instead you trade out some of your efficient removal for more higher cost but bigger reward payoffs that fit into the theme of your deck. And, try to build your deck to make sure that what you are doing during the all setup stage of the game is fun. If your focus is on this, as opposed to turning the corner and going for it, you will likely have a deck that's much better suited for casual games, and one that you're going to enjoy, even if you're not putting people on the clock. I've spoken recently about my Trailosara Moon Dancer deck, and this deck is a blast to play. Even when I'm not winning, it's not very hard to assemble an engine, where I have a life gain trigger usually once or twice every single turn, which makes Trailosara bigger, and allows me to scry the top card of my deck to try to find another piece that's going to help me in the current board state. I feel like I always have something to do, even if my opponents have plenty of chump blockers and I see no easy way to get Trailosara evasion of any kind to actually close out the game. That part of the build is intentional. I only have a few limited ways to give her trample and to end the game from there. Similarly, I've really enjoyed playing my Scrappy Cat deck with God Eternal Oketra. Yes, it does have some powerful ways to close out the game, and if I can assemble four or five pieces, I can put together an infinite combo which generates an infinite number of 4-4 zombie warrior creature tokens with vigilance. But I also have no way to give them haste which means that my opponents do get a full round of the table to react to a 4-5 to card combo that wins the game. Plenty of time for them to be able to interact, and plenty of time to stop me when I'm trying to assemble that kind of a board state. At the end of the day, these decks aren't just fun when they win, they're fun when I get to play them and I'm doing the thing, getting 4-4 zombie warriors off of God Eternal Oketra. Or trying to get lots of life gain triggers to grind value out of Trailosara. These are fun during the all setup stage of the game, and win or lose, it is still a hoot to play them. So what do you think? Casual is definitely a loaded term in the modern commander discussion, and one that probably still needs a lot more discussion. Sage themselves said that we probably need a better term for this level of deck building. 
Another term I've heard thrown around is something maybe like a binder build or even free to play. Players who are assembling their decks using cards that they've assembled from other formats like draft or sealed in order to build their decks without necessarily investing money directly into buying new cards for Commander. You can tell us what you think on YouTube, where we are Gemstone Mind Podcast. Feel free to leave us a message in the comments, or you can add us on Twitter, where we are Gemstone Mind MTG, or you can send us an email. We are Gemstone Mind Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mind.